If you turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. I've got a special topic this morning. Special topic. I'd like to first meditate or just think on this verse here, Psalm 145, 8 and then 9. You there, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. Praise God for God, right? That's Psalm 145. You missed it there. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. Today I want to talk about God, who He is, the personality of God, the characteristics of God. But first, I want to begin with a story, and it'll be a little bit of a lengthy story, so please bear with me. Last weekend, I brought two friends over to my house. Uh, one was named Bobby, one was named Joey. Uh, no uh, um, meaning there if you know a Bobby or a Joey, but one was named Bobby, one was named Joey. I brought them over to my house. They actually didn't have a choice. I pretty much just showed up and said, get in the car, you're coming to my place, and they came over. Uh, and I want you to know at my house, I am in charge. I'm in charge of everything. Obviously, it's my place, my rules. Next to my house, as many of you know, is a train track, and I built this train track. I hear the train every night. I'm in charge at my house. And though I, I would never do anything evil, I determined that my friends, Bobby and Joey, I determined that they should sit down and handcuff themselves to the middle of the train tracks. They are incredibly wicked people, and they love mischief, so they did this. Though I did determine every bit of it. But don't tell me I'm wicked, and don't tell me I'm not in charge of my house. In the distance, we hear the train coming. Choo-choo! You know, think Thomas the train. It's right on time, the train is. I determine that too. I say to them, very clearly, they feel it in their hearts. I say to them, you're both in quite a predicament. And you know it. I say it was a bad idea for you to play with handcuffs on train tracks, even though I determined that you would. But I tell them I have good news for you. I know you're both equally destined to die, but in the same sense, I want you to know that a free gift is available to both of you. You see, I've purchased a key for you, and it's a free gift. You just have to come and get it. Stand up those train tracks and come and get this key. I won't turn you away. I never lie. Just receive this free gift, I tell them. Whoever wants to be free will be free. But they don't budge. Imagine that? They don't budge. But I walk over and I unlock Bobby. He's just laying there all limp. Stiff as a board. I pick him up and I carry him to safety. Bobby says, thanks. But only because I made his lips move. I got to grab his lips. Let me give you like that. And he says, thanks to me. I force his lips. I told Bobby he has amazing faith. I marvel at his faith. I told him I've never seen such great faith, Bobby. I told him how much I appreciated him saying thank you. It makes me feel good to be loved in this way. In fact, forever, I'm just going to keep Bobby at my house so I can force him to say thank you and to praise me and my works forever. <laughs> Meanwhile, Joey's still out there on the tracks like the disobedient little hellion he is. The train's getting closer. I plead for Joey to get up. He's there handcuffed to the tracks. I'm saying, Joey, get up. I tell him, I don't want you to perish. I want you to come to safety. I plead with Joey long and hard to stand up and come to safety. But there he is, just locked the track. I plead with him kind of like, you know, like a, a mother hen would try to gather her chickens. You know, that's how I'm kind of pleading, trying to gather him back in. But he wouldn't. He just sat there. He sat there in his wickedness. 
in his disobedience, all locked up, hopeless like. Joey wouldn't listen to my gentle pleading, so instead I began commanding him to come to safety. I said, Joey, I command you right now, change your mind and receive this free gift. Now he's squirming a little bit. He's scared as all get out. But that train comes just like clockwork and pulverizes Joey. Blood and guts everywhere. That's what you get for playing on those tracks. You hear me? And nobody can blame me. I determine everything, but, but that, that was all on Joey. Okay? Did I tell you that little Joey is only two years old? He's only two years old. <laughs> yeah, that train smashed him good. Sad thing is, I actually love children. I wish all the little children would come unto me, but that little reprobate deserved every bit of that train track smashing. And that's the end of my story. What words would you use to describe me? What words? Evil, perhaps? Maniacal? Twisted? Perverted? I mean, I'm telling him to get off the tracks. He's there. He's chained to it. Pleading that he will. Telling him to, but I'm the one that determined it all. How about unkind? Unmerciful? How about satanic, perhaps? When you hear like a satanic kind of story, that kind of sounded like that, didn't it? Imagine those were your kids. Would you use words like perfect, good, righteous, holy, just, long-suffering, merciful, upright, gracious, glorious, compassionate, majestic, beautiful, loving? Would you use those words to describe me? You wouldn't. In this story, I'm illustrating the God of Reformed theology. The God of Calvinism. The God who chose Bobby to go to heaven, but little Joey to go straight to hell. This is the God of prominent Reformed Calvinists like John MacArthur, John Piper, Paul Washer, James White, R.C. Spruill, Vody Bachman, and just up north of us in Moscow, Idaho, Doug Wilson of Christ Church. This is their God. The God of Reformed theology, and I use a lowercase g for that, is a maniacal monster. The God of Reformed theology is not the God of the Bible. Not at all. As such, Reformed theology is a blasphemous belief system that I swear is doing more harm than good. And it's growing in popularity. This maniacal God of theirs is growing in popularity. It's a false God. And with so many people following this false God, this false belief set, today I wish to rebuke it. I want to talk about how this absurdity began. And we'll get to some scripture, I promise. But this absurd view of God as one who picked Bobby to go to heaven and little Joey, an infant or a toddler or whatever age, to surely go to hell is not the God of the Bible. It's made up. It's not from the pages of Scripture, as we'll talk about. A lot of it goes back to the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant, we've heard about this before, we talked about it. And about the Protestant Reformation, as I always like to disclaim, I'm glad that the Reformation caused some people to get out of the Catholic Church. But this wasn't the beginning of Christianity at the Reformation. Christianity began with Christ, and Christian groups like the Waldensians existed over all the centuries, long before Calvin was ever born, long before Martin Luther ever nailed his 95 Theses. Christianity existed. 
But many view that as the big starting point, and those men were, those founders were so amazing that they put them on a pedestal so ungodly, it sounds like how the LDS put their prophets on a pedestal almost. Remember how the LDS have their articles of faith? We read that when we talked about their salvation view. Well, the Reformed have their, their um, confessions of faith. Man-made documents placed on an ungodly pedestal. In fact, if you ever talk or debate with the Reformed uh, person, they'll start quoting their confessions almost as much as the Bible. The Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646. Let me read to you this, because this is where a lot of this maniacal view of God begins, ungodly view of God begins. Their Confession of Faith, 3.1. This is of God's eternal decree. Read this is, this is how it goes. 3.1 says, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Let me read the rest here because now he the, the confession contradicts itself. Then it says, Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty of contingency a second cause is taken away, but rather established. <laughs> within, the, within the confession is a complete contradiction. It says that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass. Ordain means to appoint, to decree, right? You decree it. Whatsoever. That's, that encounters everything. Whatsoever comes to pass. So absolutely, the Reformed God is that person like me at my house, determining that those boys go on the train tracks, determining that they stay there, and that they face the collision with the train. Right? I ordained it all at my house. God ordains it all in this life that people are born, that they commit sin, and that there is no escape at all, despite the Bible saying there is. The Westminster Confession of Faith 3.3 says, By the decree of God for the manifestation of His glory. Listen to that. By the decree of God for the manifestation of His glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. In the Reformed theology's view of God, their God created some people to live a life of rampant sin so that they would burn in hell forever for God's glory. That's what God did to bring glory to himself, kind of like the way I'm glorying in the Joey who got run over by the train. That brings glory to God. So yes, they believe God created Joey and millions of babies and kids and teens and adults with no free will to spend eternity in hell for his pleasure, for his glory. Do you know that little baby that we lost a, a little bit back here? That little baby, who knows? Could be burning in hell right now for his glory. Think about that. If you plug this into personal moments in life, it gets really real. Because who in your home has God selected for personal, um, his glory through damnation? Which one of my kids? I've got five kids. Maybe half of them were, were created for everlasting life and half of them were created for everlasting damnation. Think about it like that, you start thinking of just about how uh, ridiculous, absurd this belief is. This is not the God of Scripture. Please look in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. Like many topics, there are a thousand verses to rebuke this absurdity. We don't have time for a thousand verses, so I'm only going to show a few key ones. Look at 2 Peter 3. This one is very key. 2 Peter 3, to show the mind of God, the heart of God. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. I have a whole bunch of verses listed on our website, truthlewison.com or bibleverseslice.com. You can look there for more on this topic to fight this battle against the absurdity of Reformed theology. But look at 2 Peter 3, 9. I'm in 1 Peter, excuse me. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. There's that word long-suffering. We read that one earlier. Long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are so many good words in this verse that show God's heart. One, it says He's long-suffering. That means He's waiting. 
I submit to you and to the Reformed theologist, what is he waiting for? The very concept of long-suffering means you're putting up with people, putting up with people, and you're, you're giving them a chance to believe the gospel. God is not long-suffering at all with little Joey. He's already determined to perish for eternity. And here it says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Did you get that note in my story? I was trying to tell this idea. I want them to get off the track. I want them. I don't want them to get run over. Yet I am the one that determined them to be on the track with the handcuffs and the train to come plow them over. But I don't want them to perish. This is the Bible. God does not, he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance, to change your mind about sin and seek the Savior Jesus Christ. That's God's heart. So what is holding people back? There is only one thing in this whole world that would hold people back, only one explanation for this idea that God is waiting for something, yet some people do not come to salvation. It's called mankind's free will. Free will. A free will is what separates man from beast. A free will is the essence of being made in the image of God. Do we see this? When the Bible says that he made man in his own image, it does not mean that he gave us fingernails and feet. Right? God is a spirit. They worship, must worship him in spirit and in truth. The image of God is not a physical form. The image of God is a free will spirit. Right? An eternal soul existence that lives on and on. That's the image of God. Our pets don't have this free will. Our pets don't have this endless soul. We do. A free will. This is what holds people back. This is the way to preach because this is truth. This is, what I, this is why evangelism for a Bible believer is so straightforward. We go into the world. We try to persuade men to believe, right? To the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. We use the word of God to build faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Whereas the Reformed theologists, those people, they'll say it's all predetermined. It's all predetermined. The faith is predetermined. While we believe faith comes from hearing the word of God just like the Bible says, the Reformed believe that faith is a gift. They completely mangle Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They take that phrase, it is a gift, and they tie it way back to the one word faith there. The gift is salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Available to all men. Acts 7.51 says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. The Reformed, the Calvinists have this ungodly uh, tulip system of beliefs, right? One of their, their points, their strong points is this irresistible grace. Yet the Bible says people resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working on their hearts for salvation, but they in their free will, they say, no, I do not want it. They don't come to the light lest their deeds be reproved. They choose sin over the Savior. We see it again and again and again. What I'm telling you this morning is that is on us, not on a maniacal God. God does not rebuke his people for not coming to the light, right? When he predetermines it. He rebukes people for not coming to the light when they choose that. And that's why they burn forever in hell, for, forever and ever they have rest, nor day nor night. Is because we made a choice to reject God. That's a just God. That's a holy God. Look at Acts 17 verse 30. So God is not willing that any should perish. That verse is so problematic to the Reformed because they believe that God orders everything. He ordains everything. So if he doesn't want anyone to perish, guess what? No one's going to perish. But our free will stands in the way of God's will. He gave us this opportunity to be a, a creature with a free will. Look at Acts 17.30. A creature with the free will is the only way you can also understand this verse. Look at 17.30. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. 
It says it pretty clearly. All men everywhere are commanded to repent. So God is telling everyone to repent. At the same time, according to the Reformed theology, He has made it impossible for such people to ever repent. They are, they are built to be damned to hell for eternity for His glory. Yet here He's commanding. That's, that's the part of the story where I'm saying, get off the tracks. Get off the tracks. I command you to. This is why. You see this maniacal monster? So again, think about your family. Maybe your child didn't die at birth. You have a 10-year-old or whatever, 5-year-old. So they believe very innocent at that age. But So you got this 10-year-old, okay? And God is commanding them, right? God is pleading with them. Yet he's determined that they could never get saved. Right? We were trying to raise our kids in the scriptures, show them the word of God, but according to God's decree, that little Timmy of yours is, is hell-bound for sure. God commands folks to get off the tracks, but they can't. To repent, but they can't. This makes no sense. I explained this at the fair. We have good conversations at the fair, and sometimes I get sermon material or Sunday school material from it. But at the fair, I was talking to a, a man and a wife, and the wife believed in Reformed theology terribly, and the, and the husband kept telling, whispering to me, I do not believe this. This is, this is nuts. And I was using I didn't even know that there was a disconnect, but I happened to use the analogy when they were standing there. I quoted the verse, um, Whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely, right, from Revelation. And I said, man, this is like me tying your husband to that tree over there and then having a glass of water and offering it to him. And I didn't even know that they were at odds with each other. He's like, I know, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. That's the maniacal God that they've created. It's not the God of the Bible. Look at Romans 5.18. Romans 5.18. But they went, guess what, that couple, they went to a Reformed church because while the man agreed with me, the wife ruled the home, which is a whole other doctrine that's very um, absurd today. Look at Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men on justification of life. Uh, this is a great verse. I use it for many topics. But what you can see in this passage is that death is universal. Right? The Calvinist, the Reformed person, they'll say, well, this verse doesn't really mean all men. This verse doesn't really mean salvation is available to all. Right? Look at this verse. There's nothing more clear. As death is universal... Everyone's going to die. The gift is universal. Everyone has this opportunity to receive the gift of salvation. Whosoever will, let them drink the water of life freely. I'm, I'm doing well on time. This is good. I was afraid I wouldn't get too much. So I have plenty of time to knock this fallacy out. There are a few fallacies when you talk to these folks. One of the big ones that the Reformed will try to do to you is they'll say, well, then you're Armenian, right? If you don't believe in, in Calvinism, then you're an Armenian. Armenians are a mess, too. Armenians add all this admixture of works, and you can lose your salvation. You've got to hang on to it. They put mankind in the equation way too much because they believe that mankind's got to hang on to the salvation, right? When we know that Jesus Christ's blood paid it all in full, we're sealed into the day of redemption. God did ordain that his blood would save to the uttermost. Once you have it, you have it. But that's one fallacy. You're either, which is, by the way, is just an either or fallacy, logical fallacy. You're either this or you're this. But another fallacy they have is this. They'll say what I've taught today, this idea of a free will, undermines God's sovereignty. If you believe that mankind is a choice, then God is not sovereign. God's not sovereign. There's a lot of ways to look at that point, that argument. But one way to start with, I want to tell you that the word sovereignty, sovereignty is not even in Scripture. Yet if you talk to a Reformed person, they will throw it out there like every other sentence. Sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, He's in charge of everything. It's not even in Scripture. But let's break it down. It's not in Scripture. Nevertheless, let's break that word down. Uh, the word sovereignty comes from the word sovereign, which means what? A king or a lord. Okay? 
a king, sovereign, they rule. I just want you to think about it logically, because Reformed confess to be so logical and smart and educated. But just think about a king. A king is sovereign of a land. He makes the rules right, and he holds the people to them. But is there any king in the history of the world that actually dictates a person's every action? Is a king not sovereign until he actually dictates what you say, where you go, everything that you do and think? They've taken sovereignty on steroids. Doesn't even make sense. They say to reject Reformed theology is to, re to deny God's sovereignty. It's a fallacy. God's sovereignty is not shown by picking and choosing individuals, Bobby and Joey, or your children, to go to heaven or hell. And it uh, doesn't need that to be sovereign. God can be sovereign by simply determining the rules for this world, for his creation, for his land. God is sovereign, friends, in that he chose believers to go to heaven and unbelievers to go to hell. This is what is called uh, corporate election or group election. The word election, the word predestinated, is in Scripture. But as we've done many times, let me end this lesson with a simple biblical way to understand the term elect, predestinated, or anything like that. We've used the analogy before. I was talking to the brother the other day, and he uses the same thing, where he goes, the best way to view election, election, and you'll find it in Scripture. Um, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 to explain this, or to start on uh, unpackaging it. Ephesians 1. We are to read our Bibles uh, holistically, the whole thing, the whole counsel of God. You'll find that the Reformed, they will just grab a hold of Romans 9 and cleave to that, just like the Armenian will cleave to James chapter 2. That's where they sit, that's where they stay. We need to read the whole Bible. And if you, if you read the whole Bible and you understand things like God's long-suffering and His mercy and the free gift available to all, you read Romans correctly. You read a passage like this correctly. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse uh, 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him, in love. The question is, I mean, it's obvious from that passage, I'm a Bible believer, it says that God made a choice before the world ever began. So does that mean that God chose Bobby for heaven and Joey for hell? And you and those you know in the same fashion, is that what that means? The key is in the phrase, hath chosen us in him. This is a conditional choice. It's a conditional election. God chose the ones who were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Let me explain this through the bus analogy. Two buses. Two buses. One bus is predetermined, ordained to go to Spokane. The other bus, and I always use this city on purpose, the other bus is predetermined to go to San Francisco. <laughs> and you can think this one through. Okay? They're both predetermined destinations, right? Someone in their, in their sovereignty, their rule of that bus line, chose one to go here and one to go here. Predetermined. So where do you fit in? Where do the riders fit in? You have a choice of what bus you're going to get on. You can choose the one going to Spokane. You can choose the one going to San Francisco. That's your free will. Yet God is still, or yet the bus administrator is still sovereign in his ordaining of one goes here, one goes there. Right? Okay, now think about the God aspect. God is absolutely sovereign. Those who are in Christ go to heaven. Right? Those who reject Christ go to San Francisco, go to hell. Okay? Two lines. God is sovereign. Mankind then in his free will chooses to come to the light, 
chooses to read the Bible and faith grows, right? And the, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase then and they choose the way of salvation or they choose to reject it. In this view, it's the only biblical, it's the only way to, to put all of Scripture together is this idea that God is sovereign in what He set up on this world. And He's also sovereign that He made mankind with a free will. And we choose. Did they, what's that Old Testament passage? I set before you um, uh, life and death, therefore choose life. There are so many passages in Scripture about, you see, mankind's faith. This is why I, I want to write a whole book one day or do a whole sermon series. You certainly could because you see so many choices and then God judging people. Just think about the choice of the spies, right? The ten spies. Two of them had what? Faith, which is the only way to please God. The two of them wanted to go. The others wanted to, um, rejected the promised land. They didn't have faith. So God judges those people for 40 years based on their choice. And then the ones who, who didn't want to go into the land, they never got to go into the land. And the New Testament par parallels this with salvation, by the way. But the two with faith, they got to go in. About a choice of faith, isn't it? You're going to trust God and His promises or not. But this is the way to understand election. When you see that word elect, according to foreknowledge of God, or chosen us in Him, is that God chose in His perfect will and in His sovereignty who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. He sent His precious Son to this world to shed His blood for all, to provide a free gift for all. Okay? And in that son was the choice. He made it very easy. I'm going to send this precious son because I love the world. Here is my long suffering. Here is my mercy. Right? Look and live. If you'll take this gift, then you will go to heaven. If you reject it, you won't. The, the Reformed view is just so absurd. God sends this wonderful gift to the world. Right? Salvation to mankind. A free gift for all available in Christ. Yet... I only sent it for some. Some you can't touch this. It's like the analogy, remember with the serpents in the wilderness and the brazen serpent? Look and live, right? You're getting stung by these, bit by these snakes, okay? But some of you look over there at Christ and get healed, and some of you just cannot move your eyes up there, so you just die and you're poisoned. Right? Does that make any sense at all? And that's the analogy Jesus Christ uses with Nicodemus. Some of those people were just predetermined to not be able to look their eyes up. If they looked, that'd be a work. That'd be working. No. Looking in faith at the Savior and accepting Christ as a Savior, that's not a work at all. That's receiving a free gift. Look at another verse here in John 1. We're, we had just enough time. Perfect. God was with us this morning. Look at John chapter 1. If we had time, I would do, I would tackle whatever little pet verses they have. We'd look at Romans 9, but we don't. But if you have this basis, you completely see it's absurd, the opposite position. Look at John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. By the way, Ephesians 1, 4 and John 1, 12, these are actually verses that the Reformed will use. They think it's on their side. But if you read it with, in the context of Scripture, and you read the verse plainly, you see what it is, time and time again, is a conditional election. But as many as the Reform would say did absolutely nothing, right? Made no choice at all. They had the power to become the sons of God. Whereas you read the Bible, what it says, word for word, but as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. That's what happens at salvation. You receive Christ, oh my goodness, now you're adopted into a new family. God does all that work, right, to change your birth certificate, to, to make you adopt in a new family, but the first step was you receiving Christ. To them give you power, become the son, even them that believe on his name. It's a conditional election. Receiving Christ is clearly the first condition. The argument, the Calvinists, I guess I got a second here uh, for apologetics. The Calvinists will run with Romans 9. They'll also run, 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 run with 
Well, you're dead in trespasses and sins. You're dead in trespasses and sins. So it's, it's a verse, a great verse. And they'll say, just as Lazarus, you know, he couldn't move. He's dead. What's he going to do? God's got to wake him up and bring him to Christ. And, you know, bring him um, a healing there. Revive him. They'll take that verse and they equate it with physical death, which is a complete apples and orange comparison, physical to death and spiritual death, right? When you're dead, you're dead unless you happen to be living when the Messiah is walking around, okay? But spiritual death is not the same, and you can be quickened by this written word of God. Do you understand back then uh, there's an argument or there's a saying that there were no dead people around Christ. Wherever he walked, he'd always you know, revive, heal people. <laughs> um, they come back to life. That was, his, that was when he walked this earth. Well, today, I believe the same thing happens with the Word of God, right? It can revive people in a spiritual sense. And so you have this dead heart sitting there, dead in trespasses and sins, absolutely. But now, as Psalms tells us multiple times, the Word of God quickens, which means makes alive. That's faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That's how salvation comes. We hear about the Savior through this holy word, and we receive Christ. That's the Bible story. The, the Reformed, in so many ways, they undermined God. They undermined Christ's redemptive act available for all. They also undermined the power of the word of God. Because they'll tell you this word does not have the power to revive an unelected heart. It does not have any power. It's wrong. It's wrong. All right. There are hundreds more verses we could look at. Again, jump on our website. We'll study it again, but that's an overview. Make sense? It's absurd. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us now as we go to our next service. Lord, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to... Um, to stand for truth against this this lie, Lord, this Reformed theology that's taking over so many hearts and minds and even churches, Lord. And it's wrong. Lord, it's an affront to you. It's blasphemous to you and your nature. I pray, Lord, you help us to stand against it strongly in this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.